And I will be sharing the session right now as well. Okay, the slides. Okay. All right, I got the slides. So we are one thirty. So we want to ensure that uh, we keep to the timing for today. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Bernard. Uh, I am the your moderator for today event, uh, brought to you by AET and supported by IEEE and as well as Utah. So I think we should start on time as well, since quite a number of us are here, and of course, not forgetting Dr. Sri's time as well. Uh, so we want to make sure that we, uh, the time is uh, taken care of. So just let me introduce briefly today's session, E&E &E Industry in Malaysia, Trends and Challenges. Uh, our speaker today, we have been a great honor to have Dr. Sri Wong Siu Hai today. Uh, electrical and electronic industry remains the largest contributor to Malaysia's export. According to MIDA, it will expect to generate $495 billion in export earnings by 2025 or contribute $120 billion to the country gross domestic products. Right. So today itself, firstly, I would like to uh, provide the to call on uh, Dato Engineer Yong to provide his opening remarks. Let me move the slides. Okay. Uh, Dr. Uh, Engineer Yong, I pass the, uh, the stage to you for opening. AET. So AET has planned to organize uh, uh, regular distinguished lectures uh, to all the associates and members uh, 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 within the ASEAN regions. So firstly, I must also pay salutation to Dr. Sri Wong, who of the president of the Malaysian Semiconductor Industry Association and uh, president of uh, AET. Uh, and U Utah President, uh, Prof. Uh, Dato. Dr. Yu Hong Tak, and also AAT Council members, some of them who have already uh, connected from Myanmar and one or two others are there already. So AAT Distinguished Le Lectures is an AAT program to promote technology, <clears throat> entrepreneurship, <clears throat> and sustainable development in ASEAN region. And of course, uh, AET also connect with uh, Asia Pacific countries like China, Japan, Korea, uh, and, and others. So today's event is organized by AET and hosted by Country Operation Unit of AET in Malaysia. Currently, AET has uh, 12 senior fellows, 260 fellows, and 115 fellows from ASEAN countries. Altogether, a total of 287 members, among which 145 are from Malaysia. So AAT uh, is, an, is an organization, NGOs, which has been quite active over the years. So we would like to thank IEEE, Malaysia section, for their support. And also, um, at the same time, also other institutions uh, and associations the IET and team and MEPA also we share some of these uh, uh, events to them to, to open up uh, for participation of the members. So very much appreciated that uh, speaker, uh, today's speaker, Dr. Sri Wong, uh, can have the time to, to give us the, 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 the openings, uh, the lectures. So uh, on, the, on the whole, E and E industry plays a very important role in Malaysia economy, right? Um, as what uh, Bernard has earlier said, E and E products are the largest contributor to Malaysian export in 2022, uh, of which is coming to around 35.8 percent. Then, uh, in in respect to that, follow with uh, refined petroleum products and palm oil and 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 others. So it's a very important sectors for E and E products. So e, e plays an important role in our Malaysian economy in terms of FDI inflow, industrial linkage, link, linkage to domestic industry, business and employment opportunity. So today we are pleased to invite Dr. Sri Wong 
who is an experienced industry player of the electronic industries to share his views and the, uh, on the trends and challenges of the E&E &E industries in Malaysia. So without further ado, I pass the chair back to the monitor, IR Bernard Lim. Please, Mr. Bernard. Okay, thank you, Dato uh, Engineer Yong. So please allow me to briefly uh, uh, mention about our, our speaker for today. We are indeed honored to have uh, Dato Sri Wong, uh, which to have us today. He's involved in the in electronic industry as the president of Malaysian Semiconductor Industry Association and champion of the E&E &E Productivity Nexus. He's a member of Pomoda, a public private sector special task force to facilitate business and improve Malaysian global co competitiveness. And of course, Dato Sri Wong has served Intel for 27 years. His last position was with Intel as a Vice President of Technology and Manufacturing Group and General Manager of Assembly and Test Manufacturing and responsible for all assembly test factories worldwide. He also served as the Vice President and Managing Directors of Dell Asia Pacific Customer Center for approximately two years. So despite his busy schedule, he has spent time with us today in the lunchtime. So uh, this important, very important topic. So especially those in, in this uh, area. So without further ado, please allow me to pass the stage over to Dr. Sri Wong. So please give us a few seconds. Uh, we are going to do a conversion of slides to, to be highlighted, but some logistic manner here briefly. Uh, please mute your uh, microphone to ensure small flow of today's talk. Uh, do not hesitate to type into the chat box for any Q&A session uh, so that uh, at the end, there will be a Q&A session. And also briefly, uh, we would also have a photo session just before uh, the Q&A session. So please be ready to stand by to turn on your camera. All right. So uh, please, uh, you can share the slides. Uh, let me see. Okay, good. Uh, Dato, uh, I pass the, the stage over to you, Dato Sri. Okay, thank you very much, Bernard. And uh, thank you for the welcoming message, uh, Dato Yong of uh, AET, and also uh, Dato uh, Professor Yu, uh, who co contacted me in, uh, initially. And uh, his English guest, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Today, I'm going to share with you the E&E &E industry in Malaysia trends and challenges. I put together a present, quite a comprehensive presentation. I hope I will cover all the interests of uh, the attendees today. Uh, if not, then you can ask me questions. Uh, Alia, yeah. The, uh, I will give a quick introduction of MSIA, some observations I see, key trends, and then some outlook, and then what we think the E&E &E industry in Malaysia should be heading. So first, MSIA, uh, it was formed uh, two years ago in January of 2021 in the midst of the uh, uh, COVID and pandemic. And um, we came about because the, the companies in Malaysia uh, needed uh, representation and getting themselves organized. Because I used to only represent the um, American companies, but then many more were affected by this pandemic. So we decided to form that in January 21. And with the four objectives, that is uh, enhancing R&D or encouraging more R&D and technology, uh, enhancing the ecosystem and the supply chain, be the voice of the collective voice of the industry, and then help Malaysia to be globally competitive. There's our four key objectives. Of course, we do many other things as well. Uh, it was officially launched on April 6 by our uh, Deputy Minister of uh, International Trade and Industry. We have uh, currently 208 members after two years. Members are from 10 states all the way from um, Kelantan, down south of Johor and to Sarawak. Uh, you can see Malaysia uh, companies are co comprised of 44%. And uh, we have many other members from Europe, US, Canada, and also of Asia. For the headquarters, they are located um, in 17 countries. And the last two years, uh, we have been sought after by Bloomberg, uh, international TV, media, 
as well as local media to talk about the E&E industry as well as the impact by COVID and what's the way forward for the country. For CNBC, uh, we had our last interview was in October last year. Next slide. Okay, this, this year we celebrated the 50th uh, anniversary of the e, e industry and we managed to do a special pull-out page with the star where we highlighted the five decades of excellence as well as uh, forging a brighter future, highlighting the Malaysia rising stars as well as Malaysian powerhouses and also talk about a section on the Malaysian dream for the E&E industry. And we launched the Silicon Malaysia map. Next. So we held the 50th anniversary in KL on May, in, on May 30th, and we launched the uh, Silicon Malaysia map. If you don't have a copy, uh, you know, maybe you can contact Alia how to get a copy, where we showed all the companies, uh, at least our member companies throughout the whole of Malaysia. And this event was uh, well attended. And the guest of honor was uh, YB Dato Sri, uh, Muhammad Asmin Ali, Senior Minister of MITI, as well as uh, YB Dato Sri Mustafa, uh, Minister in the Prime Minister's Department for Economy, as well as uh, Deputy MITI Minister Dato Lim Banahong. And uh, this is the map of uh, Silicon Malaysia. Uh, down at the bottom, or where the hot air balloons are, are the 50, the companies celebrating 50 years, and the rest are just names of companies that are located in various parts of the country. Uh, next. So let's go on to some of the key observations that we, we see. First, I think you know the world is faced with a growing, aging, and urbanized population. Population continue to grow, and people are living longer, more than 60 years old, increasing to as high as 1.4 billion, and people are migrating to cities. Not only that, we are going through this technological change, uh, especially Industry 4.0. I just highlighted two of them. They are nine pillars or 11 pillars, depending on who, where you see the information Industry 4.0, especially in IoT and AI. And all the sectors of the economy uh, are moving towards the digital space, accelerated by the pandemic the last two years. Okay, since we all can't get out to work, therefore things need to get done. And that has got to do with the digital uh, space. Only that there will be, you know, we have been on globalization all the while, and suddenly, you know, we are uh, faced with even localization. And uh, so, with companies, uh, countries worried about protectionism, secu national security, and so on, they are trying to protect themselves by bringing more of their activities and manufacturing and design and all that done onshore. And this is as a result of also of the US-China trade war. We also encountered by climate change, ESG, sustainability, you know, uh, we have red, we have uh, floods in, in uh, Pakistan, uh, we have uh, poverty throughout the world, they have not been solved. And then we have uh, social unrest in Sri Lanka, and not just Sri Lanka, in many other countries, you know, uh, Ethiopia, Iran, and all that. Uh, so these are the, the uh, things that are happening around the world, that it will impact us in one way or another. Next. Some key trends in the semiconductor. Uh, first, I'll just touch on these uh, four key trends with the Moss Law, more than more, the next super cycle and localization of the semiconductor. Next. Moore's law, as you all know, where Gordon Moore actually uh, predicted that every 18 months to two years, the number of transistors in the same area size of a chip will double. And this has been going on. You look at the graph. I don't have the graph here, but look at the graph. Every two years, you see that doubling. And and uh, in the, in the uh, late 90s, we were already questioning whether we have reached the limit. Uh, until today, they are still moving on to uh, achieving this uh, transistor, number of transistors in the chip. Uh, of course, now 
sometimes you have dual layer instead of just one layer. Uh, next. Then you have more than more. If you can't achieve the transistors there, you can do it with packaging solution. And chips can be laid out in a substrate side by side at a 3D basis, maybe the same chip or different chips, all stack up and the uh, number of transistors continue to grow and the performance also continue to be enhanced. So it never stops. And you can see on the right-hand side, some of the packaging technology uh, that have been used you know, by TSMC, ASE, and the Skyworks. Uh, next. You also have what I call the next super cycle. As you can see, you start with an IC, and then the, some, the semiconductor enables more application. In fact, now you can think of practically whatever you can think of, I think everybody is doing, you know, from EV, mobility, uh, in the e-commerce space, whatever. You know, a lot of people are applying uh, the applications in all aspects of our life, you know, the way we work, live, learn, and play. So, and as a result of that, it generates a lot more data. And this data needs to be analyzed. And there, since there's so much data, it fuels the growth of AI deep learning so that this data can be analyzed and applied continuously to solve problems and to improve or enhance business. So data is basically the new oil and the big data are fueling growth of AI and deep learning. And as a result, it goes back to the chip to enhance the chip further, and you just go in that cycle. That's why you call it the super cycle. And AI basically will drive the advancement of the semiconductor industry. And the opportunity, I guess, is there for uh, AI accelerator, compute, memory storage, and network. Now, next. Okay, so some of the uh, data that we spoke about, as you can see, you know. The data that has been analyzed today is only 2%. And the amount of data transmitted is increasing, you know, uh, 400x, uh, unstructured data only 80%, data processing, you can see 90%. That growth of this uh, data that is uh, need to be analyzed and uh, now going to be driven more by AI. And AI will power the growth of the semiconductor. And this is just a projection on what it looks like, you know, the microprocessor memory and the network. So that's how the super cycle I was just explaining just now. Yeah, next. And you can see here, there is an age of convergence. You know, everything is converging. And the rise of AI has flipped the semiconductor industry from a cyclical sector now into a growth uh, powerhouse. You know, we don't think there will be very much of a, a cyclical up and down growth, but more of a steady growth. An AI-based semiconductor will grow, expected to grow 18% year over year for the next three years. And, maybe, and it is growing 5x greater than a non-AI chip. And the semiconductor should get about 40 to 50% of this growing AI-specific revenue. Okay, so... Uh, we need to pay attention to how AI is applied in every aspect of our life. Uh, next. So with the US-China technology race and the US-China trade war and the US Chip Act and the recent US uh, restrictions on China, you know, it just get tighter and tighter. It is, dri it is driving, you know, China to find a solution. So on the right side, uh, on the left side, you can see uh, US trying to localize all the, uh, you know, integrated circuit design, wafer fabrication, that's how they have chip act out there. And then on the left side, you have China figuring out how to find a solution. And since there are certain things that we cannot, China cannot ship to the US, certain things that uh, US uh, once their players to get out of China. So, you know, they are looking for opportunities on how to solve this problem and looking for a more neutral country. And therefore, Malaysia or Southeast Asia is one of them. 
And so that's why I say we have huge opportunities uh, for Malaysia. So let's take a look at the outlook in semiconductor. As you can see, 2021, we grew 26%. That's tremendous growth. I think nobody expected that growth because uh, of the pandemic. Initially, everybody thought that every, all the business will tank and therefore, you know, we will see a major correction in the business. But however, the pandemic drove even greater use of the semiconductor, electronics, and so on uh, to help solve, of the, solve some of the problems that were faced uh, in doing business because most uh, companies were shut down, but they continue to do business on online, working from home, and uh, all the data that need to be stored and business need to continue, but everything went on digital. So that's so why you see that tremendous growth. And this year, I call it the year of two, uh, 2022, I call it the year of two halves. First half business was still very strong until they see a start, start seeing a correction in the beginning of the second half, uh, whereby there was a correction in uh, consumer electronics, like iPhone and computers and so on, where, uh, that, where it was caused by the headwinds of uh, inflation and pending recession uh, in the US. And everybody was kind of also have this fear that recession may be coming. And as a result, first half was very solid. Second half, there was a major correction. And that can be seen from the, the announcement by Micron, you know, by uh, Broadcom, by AMD, where their, their revenue were down. Even for Micron, even they announced like 20%. And some of them, 10%, 10 to 20% was like more the number. So for this year, uh, with the headwinds I will share later on, uh, we will have, uh, you know, probably a slower growth like a negative 4%. But still, achieving above 500 billion, you know, is a, a huge number, still a huge number. Uh, next. We captured, you know, as announcements were made over the last one, two years, uh, we, I captured all the announcements that were made in the papers. And you might get some double counting over here where Intel announced investments, Samsung, TSMC, Micron, TI. Everybody seems to be announcing Infineon, SD Micro, all announcing uh, investments, either in US, Europe, or in Asia. I just captured all of them and, and uh, put it together. I said, hey, it's about 1.2 trillion of investments that will be put in this year, uh, last year, this year, and out in the next five to 10 years. But even if that's not quite correct, you know, even half of it, 600 billion is still a very huge number. Even you take another half is 300 billion is still a very huge number. As you guys imagine the opportunities that we can see in the next five to 15, 20 years. Uh, next. So let's focus a bit on Malaysia. Malaysia is a key player in the global semiconductor supply chain as 7% of total global chips that are needed in the car double. And therefore, you know, it kind of balance out as I increase capacity, but then more ICs are needed in a car. Car next. Looks at Malaysia specifically, you can see the growth 2020, 386 billion of export, uh, 2021, 456, and 2022, you know, from January to November is 541. The growth in uh, 2021 was 18%, and the growth in uh, 2022 is about uh, more like 25% level. Okay, we, we have, don't have the number yet, but it's going to close around there. And as uh, you all have mentioned, the uh, contribution by uh, total percentage of export is 38%, and about 6.85% 6 of national GDP. And uh, e, e industry contributes 
590,000 jobs. I would expect it to exceed 600,000 uh, by now. And in terms of uh, investments, approved investment, 148 billion. It's quite significant, but that is only numbers. But other contributions in other dimensions, such as technology growing from, you know, uh, micron to nanotechnology, you know, seven nanometers technology, uh, and transfer of knowledge to our Malaysian workers is another dimension that is not really captured. Then you have the global supply chain management, which were used during my time, uh, all managed out in the US, but today they are managed in Malaysia. And there's also the GBS design development. And significantly, I know in my 50 years pull out, you, you don't have a copy, we still have some copies. Uh, you should see the number of Malaysians taking global and regional leadership in companies in Malaysia is many, are, are many. So uh, we do have uh, real talent in Malaysia that are able to do global uh, management of global operations. Next. If you look at our export over the years, uh, I can see the uh, percentage growth it's already exceeded 542 billion and that accounted you know in terms of uh, CAGR over the last five years like 11 percent so the growth is still uh, good and we expect over time this growth will will continue uh, although you see some cycle along the way but generally the trend will be a positive trend uh, next. And in terms of investment, you can see there was a big blip of uh, $148 billion of investment. And that's a result of shortage of capacity. And since everybody was announcing new FAP investment, you know, whether it's in US, uh, Korea, Taiwan, Europe, everyone was putting in capacity to support that growth. Uh, that's, that's why you see such a big surge in 2021. And 2022 is much lower uh, number. And I guess uh, 2023 too will, will be about the same. Uh, next. In terms of productivity, you know, uh, many times I was asked, how are we doing with productivity? You know, uh, companies always ask, uh, government always ask us, are you putting more automation into your factories? And I'm happy to say that the E and E subsector labor productivity performance actually is double or more than double the national average. So we had 198,000 versus 84 or 85,000. So uh, I'm sure with uh, more automation and more productivity improvement and the drive to increase competitiveness will drive greater productivity in the uh, electronics industry. Uh, next. Uh, some recent announcements over the 18 months, I just want to let you get a feel. Infineon announced 2 billion euro investment, Intel 7.1 billion US, you have AT&S 1.7 billion euro, AMD, TF AMD 2 billion, and uh, many more, uh, around 500 uh, million ringgit investment like Sensita, Ferrotex, and TTM. That would be generating, you know, 52, billion investment with about 11,000, more than 11,000 jobs. Uh, next. I'm happy to say that for the first time, RMK12 have highlighted E&E &E industry as one of the eight strategic and high impact industry. This is as a result of our work with EPU to explain the significance of the E&E &E industry in Malaysia. And that you know, strike the uh, government, especially during the pandemic, and how critical it is for the world and, uh, and how we play into the global supply chain. So as a result, for the first time, uh, for the 12th Malaysia plan, E&E &E has been highlighted as one of the eight strategic and high impact industry. So I'm really uh, happy that the government see this uh, industry as one, that is fast growing and going to contribute significantly to the economy of the country. And there are four focus areas that are written down here. And we hope you know, over the years, we can work on them and improve on it. Uh, next. So some of the challenges that you are facing, what are they? 
you know, first of all, as you all know, there's a big war on talent, especially in 2021 and the first half of 2022. We have shortage of workers, uh, you know, wages were spiraling, and uh, engineers who also do not have enough, I said to say, uh, one of the reasons is that, uh, you know, we have uh, 15 to 20 percent of our engineers leaving the country for so called greener pastures like Singapore, US, and elsewhere. And so that's a, a major issue for the country. Then we are facing headwinds like inflation, pending recession, the Taiwan, US, China tension you know, a potential war, but something is going to happen uh, to Taiwan. So that also impacted how supply chain is uh, impacted. Then you have the US-China trade war that I spoke about uh, in the US export restriction is not just about products. They also talk about talent, restricting talents, US uh, PR and US citizens working in China, especially on the high-end technology. Uh, I, thought, I spoke about the demand correction of consumer products. It's still there. It's impacting some of the companies here today. And supply chain disruptions. There are so many reasons out there. I just showed you all the uh, issues, including China's zero COVID policy, now that it has already opened up. Uh, and so the situation is improving. We still have pockets of supply chain issue. Okay because of demand and, and the factories are all getting themselves adjusted. Uh, next. So some of the things that we recommended to the government to help some of the issues, especially on talent, is one academy in the factory. That is to engage or uh, encourage SBM school leavers to join the factory for a mm. training program for 18 months with three months of classroom training and 15 months of hands-on training. We have an outcome-based syllabus whereby we want this person who joined the factory will achieve all these skills at the end, end of 18 months. So by the end of 18 months, then they will be uh, certified as a technician. So hopefully we can attract more SPM leavers to join the factory at the same time, a win-win for them that they do well then they can become a technician after that. The second one was to train and place. You know, we have many engineers who are without jobs. Uh, they studied engineering for four years, but then uh, factories somehow do not think that they meet the expectation and therefore some re-upskilling and uh, training need to be provided. We did that program three, four years ago on 131 engineers, 100% were placed. Uh, this last year, we had about 50 plus or 70 engineers. Uh, they are also placed. Uh, of course, the numbers are small, but then we are showing that a, a, these engineers can be trained again and put them back into the factory. Of course, at different levels of engineering job. Huh? Uh, some of them will not be able to do, for example, design and IC design, but they are able to do factory engineering or uh, process engineering or equipment engineering. And we also suggested that we need to use the strategy to use other countries' talent. Other countries are using our talent, you know, whether it's Australia, US, Singapore, all our, our talents are going out there and they happily use them. But we don't use other countries' talents so aggressively as the other countries. So I'm advocating that we work with the government to uh, allow at least to start off with hiring a foreign graduate studying in Malaysia to work in Malaysia. After all, they get industrial training and like other countries, they allow the, the foreign graduates to work in their country for two years, you know, without special uh, application of work permit. It's only after two years, then you find them suitable and you want to hire them on a more permanent basis that you can, uh, you can apply for the employment pass. Uh, we still need to continue to inspire children and students to, to pursue science, uh, technology, engineering, and mathematics because the number of children pursuing science is dropping. Somehow, they are more inclined towards the non-science, psychology, economics, and others, uh, finance, instead of uh, engineering. So if Malaysia wants to be a country of innovation, 
<coughs> we need more children and students to pursue uh, science and engineering. And therefore, we, we have to do something there. And one of the projects I did uh, in Penang was to establish the uh, Tech Dome uh, Penang, which is a science discovery center, the first in the northern region. And uh, hopefully that discovery center allow children and students to go there and explore you know, all the fundamentals uh, of science where they just not just study, but experience uh, you know, the, the principles of science. So hopefully that will inspire them to ask more questions and be interested. Last but not least, of course, uh, we have to work on our education, quality of education. And that, of course, is outside of my purview. But then if you don't work on it, uh, 20 years later, we will still be talking about the same problem. So I hope maybe the new government can look into this and work on improving the quality of education and improve the standards. Thanks. So. We, in MSIA, think that Malaysia should be one of the leading E&E &E industry engines of the world. We are already recognized. We are 7% global trade flowing through here, 13%. But there's so much more that we can do. <laughs> Wherever we are doing well, we can double down on what we, are, what we uh, can do. And we are successful and can compete, either in the area of FDI or domestic investment, and all the smart, high-tech, high-value manufacturing, state-of-the-art technology all get transferred over here and, uh, and hopefully can also de develop over here, including automation and medical device. Then we want to promote Malaysia automation industry mm -hmm. to the world. We really have a very strong industry in automation that, are, that is uh, contributing to the semiconductor industry. And we encourage more companies to buy local so that we can create uh, waterfall effects. We have many companies like this who are doing like Kisai, like Inari. You know, sometimes we call this an Inari waterfall effect because they buy a lot of local equipment. And hopefully that will help the companies to grow and, be, and grow globally. Because sometimes these companies have other factories around the world and their equipment can be used in other parts of the world. We also strongly encouraging design development, especially in IC design, embedded system design, or whatever design that can help the industry to put a, a stake for their future and compete in that uh, design and development uh, area. So for example, Skychip, the first company that can do an IC product design up to uh, as low as seven nanometers or even lower. Uh, SwiftBridge can do a precision high RF coaxial test cable solutions up to 110 gigahertz, supporting 5G test uh, environment, and also can be used in the uh, spacecraft, for example. And we are working with NCER on tech to establish a technology innovation center, whereby it will help our Malaysian companies, especially SMEs, or even startup, to do innovation work, design development work, by lowering the cost. So we work with uh, NTIC and establish a center of excellence, for example, in mechanical design or in industry 4.0 or test development, even IC design, where the company do not need to buy the tools. They just pay per use. And we are proposing to uh, NCR that we co-fund the development. So that development, let's say, cost 20000 we co-fund 50-50. So we lower the cost. The company don't have to buy the tools, use the tools, and then at the same time, if uh, we can, we help them to commercialize. So that's the direction we are heading. Hopefully, we will see some announcement later part of the year on this end thing. Uh, not only that, uh, I'm also encouraging the government to see whether we can attract wafer fabs more wafer fabs in the country, okay? Because there are so many wafer fabs that are being announced. I cannot remember the number, like uh, this last year was like 15, and this year, I don't maybe another 10. Before that was another 10. So, the, but none are being, uh, you know, built in Malaysia, you know? So I think we, we can attract maybe a few, you know, uh, two to three fabs to build in Malaysia, 
then we can uh, more or less complete our ecosystem because we don't have enough fabs in the country. We have a lot of assembly tests. So hopefully we can enhance our ecosystem and have more multiplier effect and development of our people in the whole uh, semiconductor uh, industry or technology chain. I think with that, uh, thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sri Wong, uh, for the presentation. Uh, excellent, a uh, lot of new insights, including myself, for what I heard today. Um, so right now, before we go into our Q&A session, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we will do a quick uh, photo session, and then uh, we will go into the uh, Q&A session. I hope that all of you could please help to turn on your camera so that we can take a quick uh, photo session. Uh, right? Just good to see everyone as well. Uh, even though we are on virtual, it's good to see everyone. So there are actually four pages all together. Good. Uh, a lot of uh, uh, familiar faces that I see online as well. Good. Uh, all over, uh, including I see uh, from Philippines as well. Good. Thank you very much from Brunei. All right, good. Um, uh, there'll be two persons taking, uh, Dr. Folk and myself will be taking a photo as well so that we can share. So I would count to roughly yes. 10. Uh, I hope that we can get as much as possible, right? Uh, five, four, three, two, okay, one, we were captured. Okay, first page. Uh, please continue to smile. We are not sure whether you're in which page. Two. Three. Four. Okay. Okay, did we manage to get all of them, Dr. Folk? Yes, yes. yes. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Uh, so we got everyone. All right, good. Uh, we have approximately about 10 minutes uh, for Q&A session. Uh, please utilize your time, uh, you know, these are valuable time and information. I know all of you are coming from different industries and good that we actually have these sessions, uh, you know, to ask uh, Dr. Sri Wong. Uh, you can have two options to, uh, to ask questions. One, you can actually use the chat box uh, or if you don't mind, uh, you can actually unmute and ask the question as well. So you have two sessions uh, to cut. If you're comfortable, you want to talk over the line, just unmute yourself and uh, talk. Otherwise, you can chat right, in the chat box. Do you have any, any questions from the floor? Um, okay, I don't see any questions. So if you don't have, maybe... Maybe I, I have one, uh, Bernard. Uh, okay, can, Bernard. Can, yeah. no problem, uh, Dato. Okay, okay, maybe this uh, question is to Dr. Sri Wong. What do you think about the geopolitical situation between uh, US and China, uh, in, uh, especially they're trying to block the technology uh, to China? So will that have any impact in China as a, in the semiconductor industry as a whole? Or do they have already uh, have uh, other solution or other ways or, or they're not concerned about that? Perhaps. Yeah, China, as you know, when the US put all the restrictions on China and, and so on, uh, it is actually very tough on China, okay? Because there are so many, they don't have many things, okay? Even though they have, the application may be very good, but the fundamentals, you know, are still not, uh, they don't have solutions for everything. So, uh, that I believe uh, China has already started because if you look back over the years, China has announced an IC university. They put in 1.3 trillion renminbi to acquire technology. Even before that, they were already acquiring technology. They're putting money. And they, because they had this uh, uh, technology roadmap that they're going to increase their uh, 15 or 20 percent of China made products. And, but they are using something like 50%, you know, so they are still a long way to reach the number of made in China. Uh, but now with the restriction, it's even worse, right? Because equipments are not available, tools not available. So China will have to find a solution. I'm sure if they work hard enough, I'm sure they're working already very hard to find a solution. And 
and I'm sure they also will look out to the non-US kind of countries to see whether they can find solution in that area as well. So we will know, you know, as we go out in time. But now I think uh, they will not have the latest technology. Actually, China is still not, not there yet with the latest uh, technology, even though they, they are working on it. Especially like the machines coming from Holland, right? <laughs> Ah, machine, the UE machine, yes. Not, not just Holland only, there, there are many others. Of course, they are from Japan and all, they all look yeah. like they are all in the group, uh, grouping to prevent giving uh, yeah. production missionaries to China, so, right? So China says that maybe they can find a solution using, uh, what they call it, the uh, lesser, not the leading edge, but the tra slightly tra trailing edge technology. Mm, mm, they, can, they can still find solution using the 28 yeah. nanometers instead of the seven or five or three nanometers. Yeah. So you'll see whether they can have that breakthrough. Mm -hmm. Okay, because okay. On, the, on, on the whole, because not just, of course, the other side effect is perhaps like country like in Southeast Asia or Malaysia, we will gain because of this geopolitical issue one way or another from the investment point of view. But I think on the other hand is... Uh, Eventually, are we continuously going to benefit the low-cost uh, product from China? La? Because if they don't have a updated technology, we cannot, they cannot produce a volume and then we will not be able to benefit the low-cost uh, benefits of the product. You know? well, for the consumer, la, for the uh, low-cost, yeah. uh, for the volume that they are producing, of course, the cost is lower. But uh, the high-end technology is still a challenge. La. But I'm yeah. sure they are looking towards Southeast Asia for solutions. Mm -hmm. and I know mm -hmm. companies are already working with them you know, to see whether they can find solutions for them. Yeah. Perhaps another question, Dr. Sri Wong, what do you think about Singapore uh, uh, in this aspect, in this semiconductors uh, area? Are they as good or as near to Korea, Japan? or S Singapore has uh, a lot of FDIs, uh, like uh, all these Micron and Global Foundry and so on. All the fabs are in Singapore. They have less of uh, uh, assembly tests. You have some EMS, although most of the major EMS are over here. So uh, design development, I, I, my assessment, I don't know have the data, but in my assessment, I think we are ahead, especially in IC design, but maybe in embedded system design, they may be uh, as good as Malaysia or better. Hmm. Uh, because of our, automa our automation strength, you know, we, we uh, have strong embedded uh, system designers and software designers. Uh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I, I fully supported your, one of the area in respect to education uh, because instead of you know, brain drain, we should attract more brain in, you know, and then allow, the government should look at the area of allowing expertise to come in and continue to influence our local people to be developed further so that we can sustain our presence. Otherwise, you know, give another 20 years, we are gone with this because our heydays were 20 years, 20, 30, 20, 30 years ago in, in electronic industries. Yes. But if we don't continue to sustain that, we will be gone. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. I think the government needs to be more, uh, yeah. should be less worried because every time I spoke to them about this strategy, of using other countries' talent, they all worry about we are depriving Malaysians of a job. But you look into US, Singapore, and so on, uh, of when they use, you know, let's say even Intel, when they designed the 3D6, I think about 70% of the engineers are foreign uh, engineers. Only 30% yeah. are local. True, but then you see they... how much jobs they created from a 3D6 to what they are doing today. The number of jobs they created is increasing every year. So mm -hmm. there should be no worry. But then, you know, this is an area whereby they, we need a paradigm shift uh, from mm -hmm. the government to say, don't, don't worry, we are not depriving all the Malaysians of a job, but we will be able to grow and the pie is bigger and we're going to attract and provide more higher quality jobs too for the Malaysians. So, yeah, that yeah. will take a little time uh, for, for... It's the, it's the yeah. talent pool that we must really br uh, bring up and, and build up. Uh. That's all. Yes. Yeah. I think Correct. there's another question uh, with the hands yeah. up. Yeah. So there's one question uh, in the, before we go to uh, Romelu, 
Sorry, just one question that is in the chat box. Maybe we cover that. Then we uh, go to the raising the hands, uh, Dato Sri. Okay. Uh, it's about people here. Uh, is there a declination in the number of ENE engineering graduates? Uh, if yes, how will this impact the industry and how the industry tackle this problem? Uh, I think it was addressed. Sorry, what, what do you mean by declaration? Uh, Declining, declination, decline, decrease, 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 or decline, or decrease, uh, decrease. Yes. In, uh, you know, in fact, <clears throat> nearly every university I speak, I spoke to about the number of uh, students registering for entering uh, courses is dropping. So, in fact, uh, for the E and E uh, uh, program, more women are taking up electronics. Yes. Very true. So um, somehow we need to encourage more uh, and, and to encourage them, uh, we will have to start from young uh, that it is not so uh, difficult. Number one, uh, you have to strengthen your mathematics. Your mathematics score is low. Like in our PISA score, we are low. Uh. We, our standard is like form five students mm. opposed to form three standard. Uh. So, <laughs> you know, in the, in the global, global uh, uh, benchmarking, so we got to work on this uh, to improve the uh, mathematics skills as well as the interest in science. Then you have more children pursuing this. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Sri. So let me go to uh, Romelo, NG Romelo. Uh, you have a questions? Yeah, good afternoon. I think uh, this will be uh, my question is uh, with this current shift of uh, political uh, shift of, of American towards China regarding the manufacturing of chips. Will they go to the uh, Taiwan or the other countries, uh, especially, uh, let's say, in the Asia Pacific? Or they will stick with Taiwan, which I think number one uh, supplier now of chips? Yeah, Taiwan, of course, is the biggest supplier lah, huh, of, of the semiconductor right now. And of course, uh, China is trying to claim Taiwan as part of China. US wants to claim Taiwan as part of the uh, so called. Uh, alliance and so that's why this uh, tension of Taiwan is very important but of course if Tai if China can you know enroll Taiwan then of course it will help them solve a lot of their problems because Taiwan has the knowledge you know for for mm -hmm. technology and and the manufacturing process True. so how this is going to turn out is uh, hard to tell uh, because US is going to be very tough uh, not to allow Taiwan to be taken over by China. But then China think that uh, just like Hong Kong, you know, over time, they would uh, hopefully uh, get Taiwan back. So that one, uh, I think still uh, some way out. Yeah. But meanwhile, uh, they have to find solution because if that don't play out, they still need to find a solution. Uh, China still need to find a solution. So how yeah. are they going to do it? As I said just now, they have to reach out to uh, expertise, especially in Southeast Asia, whether it's Malaysia, Philippines, Vietnam, wherever the expertise are, to see if they can reach out to them or not. And then, so you also have scientists from US who are not welcome in uh, US and being asked to return. Uh, so these people could also, of course, uh, help China. But how this is going to turn out is uh, you got to see like, how, you know, because you really need the experience to turn it around. And some of them will take time. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sri. So we got about two more, we'll take two more questions before we end. Uh, David, you have a question on your side, uh, David. Okay, uh, thank you, Bernard, uh, for letting me asking questions. And good start, uh, afternoon, uh, Dr. Sri Wong. Uh, good to see you again. Uh, I was a former Intelier working on IC design when you were the VP over there in the manufacturing. <laughs> good to see you again. <laughs> okay, uh, I have two questions, very quick one. The first question is that, uh, what are the things that Malaysia needs to do in order to be as competitive as Taiwan? Because Malaysia itself, the size is almost the same. And also, we have the talents uh, as many as uh, the Taiwan, just a small small island. So what are the steps that we can do to be as competitive or leapfrog Taiwan in terms of uh, semiconductor manufacturing or IC design? Okay. The second question is that, uh, is there a possibilities for the ASEAN countries to work together as an alliance in order to enhance ourselves in terms of uh, IC uh, 
semiconductor manufacturing and IC design because we look at the uh, European unions, uh, the countries they are working uh, very closely together. So they help each other in terms of uh, manufacturing and IC design. Just for example, when I uh, did my PhD in the UK, so my microchip wasn't uh, fabricated in UK, but we sent it to the countries, uh, for example, in Germany or Belgium to help us to fabricate. And then they work together very closely in, term, uh, in the industry and also in academia. So I'm just wondering if the countries, uh, among the countries in ASEAN, we can work together in order to produce uh, a greater results. That's my questions. Thank you, Tato. I think try, uh, Taiwan started on the right foot because in the early 80s, Taiwan was a uh, very different from Malaysia. Malaysia have taken the strategy of attracting FDIs. Taiwan has taken the strategy of develop their own homegrown uh, companies, you know. So that's how they came out with the Sinchu Park and all that industrial park. And then they came out with uh, their E3, you know, to help the local companies. So we have taken a different path. So now uh, we are trying in Malaysia, if you want to follow Taiwan, then you got to attract more Malaysians to come out. If not, if not, our strategy will continue to be FDI, foreign you know, investments to come in. So uh, that's why uh, they are, since we are already 50 years in this industry, they, we have talents who are actually quite capable to develop things and innovate themselves. The issue is how do I attract them to come out, to develop, uh, to, to start, uh, you know, the innovations that they all are capable of doing. Taiwan, you don't need that uh, encouragement. They are natural, you know, to come out. They, they prefer not to, to join the multinational. Same with Korea. Korea, they're very proud of their own Korean brands, you know, versus the foreign brands. So it's very different. So we have to have a shift like in paradigm to encourage more of our people to come out. And therefore, uh, this is a, a separate discussion. Uh, how are we going to do that? So we have, just now I mentioned a few companies earlier uh, that are coming out. We also have very successful automation companies that you can see, Vitrox, Gate Tech, Mental Master, and so on, DWC. And there are many, uh, just to name a few. So if we can attract more of these com to companies, uh, people to come out, then I think we have a better chance of success. Uh, we call it Malaysian. Uh, but if not, then our strategy will be just uh, foreign direct investments. So it will take time to do that. And Taiwan also have more engineers than we do. So there are a few things that I mentioned, like improving the quality of our engineers, encourage more people to study science engineering. And meanwhile, when all these are taking place, we got to use the strategy of foreign engineers uh, to help Malaysia to grow. Uh, because we miss quite a lot of opportunities uh, because we cannot have enough engineers. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dato Sri and also David and the oh, rest. Sorry, my us. second question, uh, Bernard, just oh. now. Uh, okay. uh, is how okay. the ASEAN country can work together uh, in order to enhance uh, okay. our capabilities. So one of the things is that uh, last time I, I uh, suggested, you see like EU, they have a free movement of people. They can, if I'm in EU last time, if I'm in England, I can go and work with in Germany or Austria can go to Germany because they are part of EU. They don't need special work permit, so to speak. Uh, that was one of the proposals I, I gave last time to ASEAN. You can have free flow of people, talents all around. Then it'd be easy, you know, to uh, get talents in that area to, to do it, to, to do a project. But now because of uh, digital uh, work from home and work from far, you know, you can still do that with, uh, with all the technology. But then, you know, yeah, this movement, then I think that will help. That's number one. Number two is you got to share technology. Lah, and that is a, a more difficult thing to do. Uh, you know, not, not so straightforward to say I share technology because then you have to work on the issue of IP and all that. Uh, how all this is going to be you know, uh, shared and deal with, uh, especially like you all, if you do a project with the university, the university say who owns the IP, you see. Uh, do you also argue with the uh, professor uh, <laughs> uh, of you, if you're all doing it, then you know, the industry say it's my IP, you know, and you say, no, no, no. Yeah, yeah. I'm spending time on it. So all this need time uh, to work it out. I'm, I'm sure there is a model already, but still, uh, quite a lot of few things like this have to be worked out. But okay. again, 
uh, a lot of countries are worried about about this you see you're taking away jobs from my like, people or people moving away from the country again all this need to be worked out like that that fear need to be taken away okay i okay, think thank I you yeah, thank you, I think, thank you very much uh, Dr. Sri. so i give one uh, 30 seconds to prof you maybe you would like to have a closing remark uh for today thank you very much okay. uh thank you bernard uh Thank you. I think on behalf of AAT, we'd like to actually express our sincere gratitude and thanks to Dr. Sri Wong uh, for actually sharing very insightful actually presentation with us so that we understand the trends and challenges and together how we can actually make it better to help Malaysia actually to gain from this uh, 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 growth uh, of this uh, semiconductor industry. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I got okay. the Thank you very much. Okay, bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Thank you, Bernard. Thank you, Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye.